Y'all, I am not gonna lie. I'm scared. I've got so much to say and I have like six pages of notes here. So we are going to attempt this and I just hope it goes okay. That is all I desire, just okay. Hi, my name's Bailey, welcome to my channel and today I am doing a review of Crescent City by Sarah J Maas. And this is not going to be a very positive review, I'm not gonna lie. I will say, I went from loving to hating this book within like 24 hours. I posted a vlog of me reading this book and that vlog is all positivity. So if you really want to see me being super positive about this book, you can watch that. The reason I post it is because I just put a lot of editing effort into it. So as much as I don't agree with a lot of my opinions in that video now, it's still up. Like if you watch that video, it's gonna seem like I have like a twin that's super positive and a twin that's super pessimistic and like kind of a dick because I rated this two stars now. I originally gave it five to five stars and I think the reason that happened is I think I was just excited to be reading another Sarah J Maas book because back in my younger days, basically like two to three years ago, I was a big Sarah J Maas fan and those are books that like I had a lot of positive memories with and I'm starting to think that if I read them again I would probably dislike them so that's kind of sad but I think it was just like the positive feeling I had reading those books for the first time was kind of trailing into this one but then when I kept thinking about that book after the fact decided I didn't really like it so it was kind of rough but that's so I completely changed my opinion it was five stars at first and now it's two stars so clearly this review is not going to be that happy-go-lucky I'm not going to do a non-spoiler section for this book because we don't have time for that I've got six pages of notes to go through guys we don't have time for non-spoilers I'll give a synopsis of this book and then that's it for my non-spoiler section to be honest. So this book follows Bryce Quinlan. She is in her early 20s when this book starts and she is just having a great time being a new adult and parting her way through life. And then one day her best friend is murdered and the murder is allegedly put away. But then two years later, these murders start up again and she is tasked with finding the murder and cracking the case. And this dude named Hunt Athelar is, you know, her partner in crime, has to help her out with this. It gets a lot more convoluted in the middle, so I can't really say much more on the synopsis, to be honest. And yeah, I don't have time for a non-spoiler section, but I'm going to be honest, if you've read Akatar, you've spoiled yourself for the general story arc of this book, so. Just gonna point that out to you, but yeah. I'm gonna be spoiling shit now. So how I've written my notes out and how I've decided I'm gonna try to do this is I'm gonna just go through it with the plot and then I have some more categories toward the end to talk about. But we're gonna go through the plot because it is a fucking convoluted mess. There's simultaneously nothing going on and too much going on throughout this book. Like in the middle, nothing goes on. And then at the end, too much goes on. So we're just gonna go through this. So basically in this world, it's all sorts of supernatural things like werewolves, vampires, fae. Sarah J Maas didn't want just fae this time, she wanted all of them. So Danica, our bestie here, is a werewolf. So basically Danica is Bryce's best friend and she works for the government here, whatever. And she busted this guy who is a human rebel or the leader of a human rebel group. I forgot his name. He's completely irrelevant, so you don't really have to remember his name. And so she's kind of on edge about this because she doesn't want him to be released. Yada yada yada, 50 pages happen. Bryce goes out clubbing with two of her other friends, Danica and her pack of devils, which is her pack of werewolf people, stay behind at the apartment and she's out partying, snorting lines of all sorts of drugs and just having a great ass time, right? And she shows up back at the apartment and on page 62, we find out that Danica Fendier and the pack of devils was brutally murdered. After this, Bryce like chases after this demon that she sees in the hallway because she thinks that's what's killed. Danica and the Pack of Devils. She has her badass moment where she's running like barefoot through the fucking streets of Crescent City, high off her ass. And then she gets attacked by this demon, but she does end up saving this angel dude. So I mean like, silver linings, right? She's taken to an interrogation room. And the, her half-brother, Rune, who is the Prince of the Fae, shows up at this interrogation, right? And I just want to point out this one line because Bryce is being interrogated by the, I forgot what they, the Triari or whatever. And she's being interrogated because they're like, oh, did she have anything to do with the murder or whatever? It's kind of the standard protocol shit. And this is on page 87. There was a comment that I found kind of hilarious. Basically, Bryce is the half-sibling of Rune, who is the Prince of the Fae. Her father is the Autumn King of the Fae. So they're kind of keeping that a secret because her being part of that family, nobody's supposed to know, right? So he says they're distant cousins. And then we have this line. 
distant family. I heard the Fae like to keep their bloodline undiluted. And I was just like, Sarah J. Mass, you don't want to say that because you're roasting your own OTP in your other series. Like, Rowan and Aelin from Throne of Glass are distant cousins. I'm like, maybe don't point that out because I, I remember the relation between Rowan and Aelin. Don't want to roast- you don't want to act like you're all in the know, you know what I mean? Because you wrote a couple that is distant cousins. So, I guess it is true. The Fae like to keep their line undiluted. But these two aren't dating. They're not dating because they're half-siblings, and that's too far. That's too much incest for Sarah J Maas. And there's a few lines in this book where she kind of low-key roasts a bunch of things from her other series, but then it's like, this book also falls into a lot of those categories, so I don't know why we're doing those little, like, self-aware jabs when you're still writing the same kind of stuff, but okay. So yeah, the alleged human you have radical dude is put back into prison because they assume that he was let out of jail and went and murdered Danica right after because she originally put him in jail, so he's put back in jail. And then we jump to two years later. And these murders start back up again that are similar and, like, the same as how Danica and the Pack of Devils died. So Micah, who is the governor, whatever, whatever, the big governor dude of Crescent City, he strolls up to Bryce's place of work at this gallery, and he basically says, You are so unqualified. I believe that you can do this. You are going to solve this case for me. And this is when Hunt Athalar kind of jumps in. He is a fallen angel. He was part of the Angel Rebellion back like 200 fucking years ago. And now he is this, he is a slave to the Republic and his magic is being kind of suppressed. So that's just some backstory on him relevant later. So he is tasked with like watching over and making sure Bryce doesn't get herself killed while she's like trying to crack the case on these murders and everything else with fucking Hunt is really irrelevant. Like he has this bargain with what's his face Micah to buy his freedom basically. He has to kill the equivalent number of people he killed in the rebellion. So he killed like upwards in the thousands of people. So now he has to kill thousands of people for Micah so he can even it out and be free. I don't know. It's kind of irrelevant until the end and it doesn't really do much. So now they're on the case. They have, they have to solve this case before the summit which is when all these leaders congregate to talk about their issues. And so that's just over a month away when we make this deal with Micah. So that happens on like page 140. And then until page like 450, nothing really happens. There's a solid 300 pages of nothing content, but we'll go over the small things that do occur in that time. So we do have to touch on this for a second. Before Danica's murder, there was this citywide blackout in which this magical fey artifact called the something horn, but it's just referred to as the horn, is stolen. And Rune, Prince of the Fae, is tasked with finding this horn after two years because now suddenly the fey need an ego boost and they need to find the horn. So the Autumn King's like, yo boy, go find me that horn. So he's trying to find the horn at the same time as Bryce and Hunt are trying to solve this case. And those two things kind of become intertwined at one point, so that's why it's relevant. And we also tangent on Tarun. He's a starborn fae, which is another special type of fae that can basically use starlight, create a light show. It's really not that great. But Rune's not even good at being a starborn fae because all he can do is make like little sparkles. So he's the chosen one and that's why he's kind of special. So he's the prince of the fae and a starborn fae. So lots of respect. Everyone really cares about him. He's chosen because of the starbornness and we'll get back to that because it comes back. There's just a lot of plot points that are coming back. Yada 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 shit happens. We discover that the thing that's been killing people allegedly is this thing called the Crystallis Demon. It's a mostly undocumented demon and even Hunt, the demon hunter, <laughs> is not really that aware of what's up with this Crystallis Demon. So now we're searching for that. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for whoever is summoning this demon to kill people because the Crystallis has just historically been used to track down the horn. So now that's why the horn is relevant, because now Rune's looking for the horn and they're looking for whoever's summoning the demon to find the horn. So it all adds up, don't you see? There's a few more attacks, yada yada, and then we discover there is a new drug on the streets called Synth, which is synthetic magic. A really creative name, I know. So basically, this synthetic magic can give humans, like, even po more powerful abilities than the actual veneer. By the way, all the supernatural creatures are called veneer. So basically, it gives human people magical abilities and such, and it gives veneer even more magical abilities, but if it's taken in too much or taken in excess, you basically rip yourself to shreds. So it's not really great, it's kind of dangerous, and you don't want that on the streets. So this drug has ended up on the streets, and we have to deal with it, but then Meanwhile, this woman named Sandriel, she's another one of the governors, like she's equal with Micah. She shows up early for the summit because she has to look over it for the Republic. By the way, 
this world, there's like two land masses. It's generally called the Republic. These people called the Asteri rule over the Republic. And then there's the governors that rule over separate segments of the world. And Sandriel's been sent over to look over this summit with Micah. Yeah. So she shows up early and this is when we kind of got to talk about the fact that Hunt was part of the Angel Rebellion in the past and that was led by this woman named Sahar. Sahar is the twin sister of Sandriel and Sahar was murdered during the rebellion because she led the rebellion. So Hunt's got some PTSD and he can't even like move when he's around Sandriel. So yeah, Sandriel also owned him at one point and was torturing him. So it's also another side note. She's also very irrelevant. So it doesn't really matter because she's dealt with by the end of this book. So it's like, okay. So that's just know that she's here. So we kind of discover that the Crystallis Demon is just a side effect of people using Synth. So when they take Synth, it just summons the Crystallis Demon accidentally. And then we kind of realize that the Crystallis Demon has nothing to do with anything. And all the work we've done for the past 300 pages has been for nothing. So it really makes reading those 300 pages really worth it. Almost seems like that stuff could have been cut out because all it is is fluff content and sexual tension and blue balling. There's a lot of inconsistencies in this book, by the way, with people and their strengths. Like, Brace is half fey, half human, right? So she should have, like, barely any magic, which it says she has barely any magic. And she hasn't made the drop, which is how you become an immoral. This happens before we discover all the shit about Synth. There's this attack on the club and it's blown up. And she survives that attack with barely a scratch. Like, and I don't understand that because there was Veneer who were blown to smithereens in this attack, but then she just like has a little cut on her leg and she's got no magic. I'm like, okay, like it's very inconsistent. Like how are there people who are immortal being blown to smithereens? And then this girl is just completely fine and she's practically a human. All right, okay. Cutting back to where we were before. So 300 pages meant nothing. The Crystallis is not the problem, it's synth. Around this time, I don't remember exactly when. So Hunt was defending breaks from these essentially bullies and he gets in trouble for this and he gets his wings cut off and they'll regrow because of course they will but that is when like essentially right after that happens he goes back to the apartment with Bryce and he's like down to fuck and I'm like you've been blue balling me for 400 pages and now suddenly when you cannot have sex now you're ready to I'm like okay so we don't even get a full sex scene we get a fingering scene and then he gets injured again obviously because he's got two fucking holes in his back that's a tangential thing i'll talk about that later in another segment of this review throughout this these 400 pages we've been talking because we're we're like halfway at this point so throughout this time we've been kind of discovering that danica was doing some sketchy things right before her death so we discover that she stole the horn and she knew about synth and she was taking synth and so we discover that her murder was basically a murder suicide because she had overdosed on synth killed her friends in like the pack of devils and then she tore herself apart afterwards so it's kind of brutal kind of disgusting and kind of sad so that means that bryce is kind of done we've allegedly solved the murders it's really great it's really really satisfying for the reader to know that we spent 300 pages doing nothing and then within like 50 to 70 pages it's all been solved great so obviously she's kind of upset because the reveal that all the murders were synth overdoses is kind of unsatisfying and she also just found out her best friend was lying to her about a lot of things. Then at some point Hunt and his little squad of other previous rebels are caught buying synth because this, this, uh, they were going to use synth to get back their magic, y yay, <laughs> but they're caught doing this. So when Hunt and his squad are caught buying synth, so during this scene that's we have like a lot of exposition and like monologuing about how this all fits together yada yada that means that it's completely all solved so bryce is completely off the hook after this she's also really pissed because like hunt's been lying to her and he was apparently gonna go buy synth even though he wasn't he was going to go tell everyone to like stop doing that he was just gonna do the deal and then walk off because he he was like oh bryce i want to be with you yay so he was not gonna do anything bad because he's an angel literally he's been reformed so he wants to be with bryce now she was his new dream but he gets caught and he is punished for it and she basically says so bryce during the scene is kind of you know feels betrayed so she's like i don't want to ever see you again to hunt but then she goes home and like two seconds later she's like um i'm still in love with him i'm going to go get him back so obviously she's not too bothered about this betrayal you know you lied to me? Oh well. So the other two people in his little squad are like murdered and the other one is sent to the bottom of the sea or whatever. 
great. They're really irrelevant too, so it really doesn't matter what happened to them. And then Hunt is sold back to Sandriel for his, like, slave. He's still a slave to the public, as we remember. Remember that little tidbit? So he is sold back to Sandriel, who, you know, tortured him. Micah owned him at this point because he was living in Crescent City, so he owned him. Um, Micah gives him back to Sandriel because, you know, he betrayed his trust. Whatever. So he is now owned by Sandriel, and Sandriel is coming to claim him and, like, take him to the summit with her because she's gonna go to the summit and then go home, right? So we're in the Comidium. Is it called the Comidium? I can't remember, but I think it is. So we're walking out of the Comidium. Sandriel's like got her old squad. She's got Hunt and Chains, whatever. And then Bryce runs through the crowd and she tries to barter with Sandriel to buy back Hunt. Now, this is the dumbest scene I've ever read and it was so cringy because I'm just like, Bryce, you're stupid. Like, why would Sandriel want anything from you? You're fucking useless. She's trying to like give up her life, even though she's worth nothing compared to Hunt. Hunt is a trained warrior. She's got a vendetta against him and he was a rebel. So like, there's no reason for her to let him go. And then Bryce still thinks she can barter with her and like buy him. <laughs> I just, it was very stupid and cringy. I'm just like, girl, stop. And she's like begging on her knees to this woman. And I'm just like, oh, respect yourself. You don't need this guy. Begging on your knees and going to like sacrifice yourself for him. Like, I don't understand the logic. Like, I don't care how in love you are with this dude. Begging on your knees humiliating yourself is just like not worth it you know because it's not gonna work out how stupid are you you've lived in this world with these veneer and these like supernatural policies you know you're worth nothing compared to hunt who is a fallen angel who was a rebel who has a lot of fucking skills who is a demon hunter and she has a personal vendetta against him you think you a half a half human even if you have like all these other things that get revealed later re revolving around you, you're still useless to her, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, she can have fun torturing you for a bit, but you're still useless. Obviously, this doesn't work out. Also, Rune lays claim over her. Basically, Rune jumps in and he's like, hey, ancient fey things say that uh, girls in the family are owned by their father and brother until they're married off, so actually you can't sell yourself because I own you. So in this situation, sexism saved the day so that she doesn't sell herself away. She basically acts like a two-year-old in this scene. I'm like, you cannot think this is gonna work. It, just, it was very, very stupid to me. Nothing happens for a bit and then the summit begins. And all the important, powerful people from Crescent City are there. This is important because later on, when we actually need help from all these people, they're all busy at the summit. Now, on page 671, this is when the overly convoluted climax begins. Mind you, we've had, like, no action, like, action scenes, and no action, like, sexually, too. But we're talking about action of, like, the punchy, stabby type right now. So up until page 671, we've got, like, nothing, right? And then page 671 is when the climax begins. That's when I consider the climax to have begun because that's when all the actual a action and obligatory exposition about evil plans happens. We go this long throughout this book having like basically nothing and then this is the climax and dude it's insane. On page 671 this clusterfuck of a climax occurs and it literally is a mess. Like it makes the book feel like a roller coaster. I actually had to Google for this comparison because a roller coaster like lasts about 50 seconds on average. So this is like a roller coaster where like for 40 seconds it's just like a straight line of like mundane curves. It's very chill going really slow and then for the last 10 seconds there's like 20 loops and then three drops and it's just like insane and you fly off the roller coaster and die on the track still confused about what just happened. The conference center that this summit is taking place at is very far away from Crescent City so people can't get there quickly. So Micah leaves the summit at some point and is shows up again at Bryce's work. <laughs> he basically corners her in the basement of the gallery which is this library and basically Bryce's boss Jessica is at the summit and <laughs> Bryce texts her and she's like hey put the footage from the gallery onto the screens in the conference center and then this climax basically is <laughs> us switching from Bryce's POV where she's actually enduring these things and then people at the summit who are just watching it like a fucking TV show on these screens in the conference center and doing nothing. I swear if these people spent less time watching what was happening on the screens and actually like flying or like going to the place that it's happening we probably could have had somebody show up there at some point closer to when they actually do just gonna point out if they weren't just sitting there on their asses like eating chips and watching this shit unfold 
probably could have been more productive. Basically, everyone at the summit is watching what's going on in the library of the gallery with Bryce and Micah now. Also, just know that <laughs> during the climax, to make it convenient for each POV to be able to watch the same action, you are able to hack and connect any technological device to the screens in the conference center in like the snap of a finger. It's super, super easy. Apparently there's no aux cords or no problems. Just know that for plot means you have to be able to connect any device in Crescent City and any device in that room to those screens. I'm not a tech genius, but I don't think that's actually logistically a thing that could happen, but okay. I don't get it twisted. That's not explained ever how that's happening. It's just for plot convenience. So Mike reveals he's a bad guy. Did we guess it? somewhat but okay so you really see the bad guy he expositions and then we also find out that danica stole the horn so basically mike has been looking for the horn so he can summon the demons of hell and do something i just he it's a traditional evil villain guy he just wants to take over the world and shit fantastic so he's basically talking about how he discovered that bryce has the horn so bish mang bong basically danica stole the horn she had it ground into powder, and then she had that t powder tattooed into Bryce's back. So now Bryce is the horn, or she has the horn inside of her, so she's the horn now. So Micah discovers this, and he tries to activate the horn, so he injects her with synth, which is going to eventually kill her. I think, okay, I think the logic of this was that he had to inject her with synth to heal the horn, because the horn was broken when it was put into her back and it's made the powder now. So that was to heal the horn. And then he needed to use his power to try and activate the horn because he still wanted to open these gates to hell, right? I think. I don't know. There's some reason, but she's injected with synth and then that's a, essentially going to kill her at some point, we think. But then I didn't bring this up because it was kind of irrelevant. But So basically she had venom in her leg from the attack from the beginning of the book and then she... <laughs> went to this witch who ends up being the queen of the witches but that's also an irrelevant plot point we don't need to talk about right now and then this witch made an ant don't deliver it to her like i think 100 pages before this so it's just convenient that that was there but that's in the gallery so just remember that but micah is just counting on her dying from this it's fine so he activates the horn and we think nothing happened he's just like oh shit nothing happened i'm gonna try it again um so they start fighting. So then they start fighting. Lele, the sweetest character who deserves so much better, uh, sacrifices herself to buy Bryce some more time. Micah runs out into the gallery again, which is the upstairs part of the library. Bryce chugs the antidote to Synth and then slices him in half and like vacuums his body up and then he's dead. So basically that whole scene lasts all of 40 pages because on page 710 she vacuums up the ashes of Micah's body and she's and he's dealt with. So that evil dude's gone. Don't have to worry about him anymore. But apparently we walk outside and his activation of the horn actually did work and all of the gates of Crescent City, if you don't know, there's seven gates in Crescent City. It's if you just look at the map you can understand this. There's gates all around the city. They apparently only have like no purpose but when he did activate the horn each of these gates became a portal to hell so now the city is overrun with demons great so bryce decides that she is going to be the savior of the world so bryce fights her way through the city overrun with demons and helps people get into the safe houses and then she doesn't get into a safe house because she was being self-sacrificing and helping other people because she's just such a great person Oh, look, we have Akatar right here, just, like, proving my point even further, but I just wanted to point out here that Bryce's character, especially, you can kind of tell in this scene, she's very much like Selena as well, the main character of Throne of Glass, Sarah G. Mass's other series, and I think it just further proves my point of these characters all being very similar to all of her other, all of Sarah G. Mass's other characters from her other series. Um, Bryce does this thing that Selena does often where she has, like, secret plans that she hasn't told anybody, and then she reveals them, and it's just, like, such a cool reveal. And she does that in this book, and then she's also super self-sacrificing, like this, like, where, like, it's, like, I guess it's a good quality, but it's also one that, like, a lot of her other main characters, especially Selena, exhibits, and it's, I don't know. Just that I point out that this is all another example of her being very similar to Sergio Mass's other characters. This check-in with the summer people, they're still sitting around and watching all this occur like dumbasses, so just gotta check in with them. So Bryce walks up to the heart gate, which is in the center of Crescent City, and she reveals that she is actually a starborn fae, and instead of being a shitty starborn fae like Rune, she can actually summon like all of this starlight, she's a special starborn fae, and she's the actual chosen one. Now, this was one of the biggest disappointments of the book and kind of made me start hating it after a while, so we'll come back to that. But basically, she's a starborn fae, she closes the one 
portal to hell that is in the heart gate and that's all great but she's used a lot of power so she kind of like sits down on the ground and she's passed out basically because her power has been over exhausted at this point now even though she's closed one of the gates all the other gates are still you know shooting out demons left and right so the Asteri's guard of people their soldiers roll up to crescent city with nukes and they're about to nuke the city so hypactia helps Hunt get his stolen magic back, he kills Sandriel, again she was irrelevant, it really doesn't matter. He and then him and the whole crew, him, Rune, and Fury, and I think Therion, I don't I think Ethereon was there too. They get in Fury's helicopter and they fly away to Crescent City. Fury was irrelevant in the whole book, by the way, too, but she's one of the friends that was clubbing at the beginning. So the Asteria are gonna nuke the city now and they're beginning to do so, so they're flying over as quick as possible to try and save the city, but most importantly save Bryce, because who gives a shit about the city? We care about Bryce. And then there's this one nuke that is going straight for Bryce, and Hunt jumps out of his helicopter, dives down, and gets absolutely obliterated by this missile. Bryce survives again. No damage to her, she is intact, but Dude, Hunt is destroyed. And this is another one of those things where I'm like, this guy should be dead as hell. These missiles make it so that Veneer cannot heal as quickly. So basically, if you're hit by one of these or in the vicinity of it, you're dead as hell. So let me give you the actual description of what happens to this guy because it is, it, he should not be alive. Like, I'm sorry. He should be dead as hell. Fuck. Basically, her legs are in a bit of pain, but she's okay, so Bryce is completely fine. Oh, and then she looks behind her to see what was like, I don't know, she looks behind her, I don't know why she does, she just feels like she should. And this is what she sees. Huntley sprawled on the ground, his back a bloodied, burned mess, and his legs, there was nothing left of them but ribbons. Nothing left of his right arm but splattered blood on the pavement. And through his back, where his wings had been, there was a bloody, gaping hole. This man has no legs left, means he's bleeding out of the stumps where his leg used to be. He has no arm, bleeding out of where that was. There is a literal hole through his chest, and he survives the book. He is not dead. Are you kidding me? This dude, I don't care how magical you are, you are dead as fuck if that happens to you. I'm sorry. You can't try and tell me that man is not dead at this point. And I was like, oh, maybe Sarah Jumas is gonna kill him. But she doesn't. She does all of that to him and he survives. That was just ridiculous to me. I'm sorry. You can't tell me that man should not be dead because he should be. Because of this, Bryce is thinking, oh, I gotta save the city. Yeah, yeah, I have to save my boyfriend. So she goes over to the gate, puts her hand on it. She's like, I need to make the drop. I need someone to help me make the drop. And shred of Danica's soul that's left, which is in the bone quarter. We don't need to talk about the bone quarter. It really doesn't matter. But she basically makes the drop with the essence of Danica's soul as her anchor, but dead people can't anchor you, so she makes a solo drop. And this is another part of the plot which is so dumb. Again, this is all the climax. This is happening within like 150 pages. So she makes the drop, and this should be impossible for her to complete, but it happens. But during her drop, so she should have no magic to inherit while she makes the drop because she is half fae, so she has like barely any magic. So she makes the drop, but since she is touching this gate, which the whole thing with the gates is that you have to give it a drop of your power to make a wish basically or to communicate with another one of the gates which is their actual purpose but basically over the years like thousands of people have put their hand on the gate and give it a drop of magic to it so since she's holding onto the gate and she's worthy she inherits all of the magic out of this gate and she makes a drop that is so far beyond where she should be dropping to and inherits so much fucking power she's even more powerful than the autumn king so she becomes one of the most powerful beings but she only gets to have this power if she, like, completes the drop and makes the ascent and, like, doesn't die. Because if you don't make the ascent quick enough, you die. So she should die, but we'll get into that. So basically, she touches the gate, drops, becomes a Mary Sue. That's what happens here. So once you make the drop, you only have a few minutes to make the ascent or else you die. Because when you make the ascent, your mortal body dies and you have to ascend back to your body to make it a mortal and to, you know, become a mortal. So you only have a few minutes and then she legitimately spends like six minutes chatting with the last shred of Danica's soul. And she's like having her own little pity party about how she doesn't want to leave Danica's soul behind. She has nothing to live for anymore. Basically they're chatting for like so long <laughs> and when she has 0 0.03 seconds left that's when she decides that she's going to try and make the ascent. There's no fucking way she should be possible by the way. There's no anger. She makes a solo drop. She spends like six minutes chatting with Danica and wastes like all of her time chatting and then when she starts to make the ascent the justification for how she like makes this ascent is that the last shred of Danica's soul like 
dissipates and pushing her up like Danica uses the rest of her being to help her but even with that that shouldn't have worked because she has dropped so far past where she should actually be like she has dropped so far past the power level she should be at that it would be hard for her to make the ascent even if she did have an anchor but then she makes the ascent like no I'm sorry that's unbelievable this is your fantasy world but also you gave me the rules that they're supposed to be playing by and then you're trying to break them like no I get that it's your world Sarah Dumas but you also told me the rules so you can't just break it without me noticing so she should definitely be dead Hunt and her should be dead as hell right now but they aren't Bryce miraculously makes the drop becomes immortal now she is one of the most powerful beings ever so she has become a Mary Sue and she's the chosen one so basically, if you want to recap here, she now has more power than the Autumn King, is like one of the most powerful beings, and she is a Starborn Fae. So she's Mary Sued herself into the Chosen One status. So when you make the drop, obviously you get that first light that we've been talking about during the book. So basically her first light from her drop is used to basically repair the city and help anybody who's been injured. But it cannot revive the people who have died. So... <laughs> Hunt is saved by the first light because he hadn't died when she made the drop, but I'm sorry. He should have died, like, on impact with the ground or, like, two seconds after impact of the, with the ground after he got blown to smithereens. Like, you can't tell me he wasn't dead at the point that Bryce came back to her mortal body and got the first light. Like, she was meandering, chatting at the bottom of her drop, and he was blown to smithereens, had a hole through his chest and was bleeding out. He was dead. I'm sorry. He was dead. She meandered he's dead but he isn't bryce survives the drop she's immortal hunt's alive and intact it's all peachy so basically the city's been saved hunt's been saved everybody's all good except for the people who have already died but like boohoo for them we don't give a shit the asteri soldiers back off and everything is all good and the six asteri basically take away hunt's slave mark because now he's got his magic back so that's all fine but he they take away his slave mark and he is free that's basically them bribing bryce into like keeping quiet about the whole asteri going to nuke the city thing and also making sure she doesn't like go out and use her new power <laughs> but i also think it's a little unfair to the other fallen people like isaiah Isaiah, who's been just an angel this whole time like he's a literal, literal angel but he's been acting like an angel too he hasn't broken any laws or any rules after he became a fallen like he's been super great great behavior but he doesn't get his slave mark taken off hunt has done like everything wrong <laughs> why does he get to not be a slave but okay basically this book ends and it's all happy and peachy keen but then in the epilogue it basically says they all lived happily ever after or did they <laughs> But yeah, that's this whole book summed up. It was convoluted and I hope I described it well enough, but Crescent City, folks, or House of Earth and Blood. The title is kind of irrelevant too. Bryce isn't even in the House of Earth and Blood. Danica's in the House of Earth and Blood. She's in the House of Sky and Breath to my knowledge. So I don't even get the title, but like, that's this book, folks. I just summed it up for you. You're welcome. Now we're going to get into a few categories of notes I wrote out to kind of talk on briefly, because that's the general plot. And now we're going to get into some stuff. The first category, and arguably the most important category to talk about here, is the smut. There is none. I legitimately went into this with, like, no expectations for anything, except for some wild sex scenes. Because in Sarah G. Mass's YA books, she goes off with the sex scenes. So it's like, in her first adult novel, she's gonna go, like, super hard, right? And there's one sex scene in this book, and it is only a fingering scene, which is valid, but also... I was expecting more, you know? Like, they even have phones in this book, and there was not a single dick pic sent. Even recent Feyre and Akatar send, like, mind nudes, and you have actual phones and you're not sending a single nude. I'm disappointed. Play to your audience, Sarah Dumas. We're here with a fantasy smut, like, and you didn't deliver. She blue-balled us this whole fucking book. So, in said fingering scene, it was a decent enough scene. It was pretty detailed, to be honest, but kind of unremarkable because the whole time I was just confused because it's like they forgot they were in a Sarah J Mass novel and until Hunt got his wings cut off and definitely shouldn't have been having sex like that's when they remember that I was looking for smut here so they start going at it he starts like fingering her as you know that's how that works um and then she puts pressure on his wounds and he starts bleeding out so they have to like you know stop doing that and the thing he asks this med witch that shows up is like am I cleared for sex like clearly you aren't because you were just bleeding out when you tried to have sex so, so his priorities are in order but yeah that's all we get there's no other sex scenes in this book 
blue balled me. It was really upsetting. Basically, the only adult thing in this book is that there's a lot of swearing, and instead of saying velvet wrapped steel, they say the word cock. So I guess that's a plus because I hate velvet wrapped steel. So that's the only adult thing about this. If you're going into this thinking it's going to be super wildly different than her other books, it's the same. But I would like to mention foot fetish. Hunt has a weird toe obsession. I'm gonna get, give you the receipts here because it made me uncomfortable. I didn't love it. So basically they're just sitting on the couch talking about something. Bryce says something and then he has this whole little inner monologue thing. So Bryce mused, toying with her toes. They were painted a deep ruby. Ridiculous, he told himself. Not the alternative. The one that had him imagining tasting each and every one of those toes before slowly working his way up those sleek bare legs of hers. He wants to suck them toes. I'm not here to kink shame, but I also didn't want to hear about your foot fetish. Basically, she's filthy and she's going to go take a shower and Hunt comes and knocks on her bathroom door and says, don't forget to clean between your toes. Why are you so obsessed with people's toes? Calm the fuck down, please. Like, I, I just thought I'd point that out. It seemed important to tell you about the toe obsession. But I do think that we're gonna get some gnarly sex in the coming books because Sarah Dumas has patterns. The pattern she kind of has with her smut in her books is basically the first book, she's like pretty conservative with the smut. And then she gradually becomes more liberal with the smut scenes toward like the end of the series and the sequels. As much as I don't really want it, I do expect Hunt to suck Bryce's toes at some point in the series. I want the payoff from these random toe comments. I thought we could talk about the representation in this book. Now, this is might get a bit of controversial, but I don't give a shit, okay? Like, this is my opinion. I didn't ever do put any disclaimers in this video, but I thought we could all kind of, you know, I didn't think it was necessary because obviously, if I can have a negative opinion, you can have a positive opinion. I don't think I need to tell you that. So, let's talk about representation. I don't think this is the poster child for representation like a lot of people on Twitter have been saying it is. I've seen a lot of people praising Sarah J Maas for this book because of, oh, all the representation, all the diversity, and I'm not that impressed. Like, I will agree that there's more representation in this book than her other books, but that's not really a high standard to hit because her other books is just a cesspool of heterosexual white people. So it's like anything is better than that. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the skin descriptions in this book are tan and olive skin. And in my opinion, that's white, but also in the opinion of Google and the general consensus of people, that's also just variations of white. So saying someone is tan does not mean that they are not white. Tan is a state of skin. Like I am not white. If you didn't know, I'm not white. I'm biracial. But when I, I can tan and I change skin tone, but I don't change races when I tan. Tan is a state of your skin when you sit in the sun. White people tan or they burn, but some white people tan and they get slightly darker, but they're still white. So tan is not a term for someone who's not white. Tan people are white. Olive skin is also white. Sorry to say, Google agrees with me still white people. That's not representation. That's just variations of white. Bryce, she's described as being gold dusted, which is, gold dusted is a horrible fucking term. Like, what does that even fucking mean? She's very clearly light skinned still, which is definitely fine. I think that you need a representation of light skinned people. But I also, also, I also don't think we should be acting like this book is the poster child for all sorts of representation because like there's a slim amount to no dark skinned people. And if there is any, they're not main characters. So it's like, you are, have some more diversity, but you're not that diverse, if we're being honest. You are doing, like, the bare minimum. You're like, oh, they still have to be, like, light skin because I still want them to be close enough to white. Also, I'd like to point out the LGBTQ representation. It's also little to none, to be honest. Isaiah has a boyfriend, which is great, so he's gay. And then it's also offhandedly mentioned that Juniper and Fury are together, which is, like, great. Let's go lesbians. But also, it really doesn't matter to me because they both have zero personality and are relevant to the plot. So I guess they're perfect for each other. In general, I think that people praising this book as like such a diverse novel with everybody being represented is a, a little bit of a jump because like, yes, in comparison to the cesspool of heterosexual white people that all of her other books are, this has more diversity. I feel like people see this compared to like all of her other books that are so not diverse and they get wet because they're like, oh my God, bare minimum diversity. Thank you, Colleen. And I'm just like, try harder, please. So now we're gonna kind of get into the world building and the writing and the pacing of this book. I'm gonna put this down for a bit because it's heavy. So, as I said before, instead of only Faye in this book, we have all sorts of magical supernatural creatures like vampires and werewolves and still Faye. You have to keep the Faye and there's angels and such like that. But despite that, this book is just like Akatar with technology. Crescent City is basically just Valeris with phones and like 
supernatural kinky bachelorette. If we're talking about in general the writing of this book, it is adult but it is no different than her YA books. The only thing that I found different about this book is that there is excessive swearing but also instead of using euphemisms they say the word cock. Those are the only differences between this book and her YA books. I would also like to say that all of her characters in this book read the same as her teenage characters from Throne of Glass. Hey, that's not to say that these characters are written immaturely generally, it's more to say that the 16 and 17 year olds in Throne of Glass are written as 25 year olds. 16 to 17 year old Selena acts like a 25 year old so when you read Bryce who is an actual 25 year old her adult actions and thought process don't seem that different than her other books because her other characters aren't acting like teens so I think that all of her characters kind of act like new adults so there's really no jarring difference between this book and her other books so if you're like scared of picking up this book because it's adult there's like no difference between this book and her other books except for this one is preposterously long so don't be worried like it's not gonna go over your head at all it's the same I don't have much else to say about the world of like the world building it's really not that like it doesn't strike me as anything I really need to talk about like it's, except for the fact that when werewolves are in their wolf form they can speak that was very strange like at the beginning of the in the beginning of the book when Danica and Bryce are walking together and Danica is walking with her in wolf form for like some reason she's like speaking English to her out of her wolf mouth and I don't know that was kind of strange didn't really love that it felt like a drug trip I'm like is the wolf talking the last thing I have to say about writing before I get into like the pacing of this book is alpha holes. I have accepted that Sarah D. Mass is going to keep saying female and males. I just accepted it. She's going to keep doing it in all of her books. But alpha holes is the nude phrase that she's come up with that she wants to say constantly. Alpha holes, if you don't want, if you want a definition, it's just like a possessive and aggressive veneer male. And I'm like, that's all of your characters, Sarah J. Mass. Even the ones who are acting like, or trying not to act like an alpha hole, are acting like an alpha hole. I just, I hated that term. I hope she, like, lo loosens up on the term in the next books in the series, because I have to read the rest of it. I'm a completionist, but I cannot stand the term alpha hole. It made me want to lose my mind. It also seemed like Sarah J. Mass trying to, like, shove down her throat so that, like, Price is a feminist, she doesn't need no man, but then she also like will sell her soul for a man, so it's kind of inconsistent to be honest. So I'm not gonna lie to you, the pacing of this book was horrendous. What happened from page 1 to page 150 is basically Danica dies and then two, we jump to two years later, the murder start up again, Micah puts Bryce on the case. So that's basically everything described in the synopsis happens up till page 150. So then till page 450, it's basically fluff content where we're chasing the Crystallos, but then we discover the Crystallos is irrelevant. We don't even need to be chasing that. So basically 300 pages of the, this book is just completely unnecessary. Like all of this could have been cut. There was nothing happening. Like we didn't have any smut to like put in there. Like it was literally just trying to build up tension between these two characters. And I get they're trying to build a relationship between them and build like chemistry, but you also don't have to spend 300 pages doing that because there was no actual like physical action. Like nothing was happening. There was like the club blows up, which is like one action scene, which is like, I think it's page 350 to 400. I think that's one that happened. So it's like you have hundreds of pages where no action of any sort, no steamy action, no physical action is happening. And it's basically nothing. It's all fluff content and it could have been cut so easily. Like the climax of this book is literally like, I'll give it like 150 pages of this book is the climax. And it's go, go, go. It's a convoluted clusterfuck of just all sorts of action that didn't have a lot of buildup because it was just like one second we're doing nothing and the next second we're fighting demons and being blown to smithereens and making the drop and doing this and that and it just it felt like it was not planned out very well so I actually think that at most this book should have been like 400 pages because so much of it was unnecessary like this is literally an 800 page book but nothing happens in like the middle so I think that you could definitely have cut this down to like 400 pages. So pacing was a mess. So we're gonna talk about characters. I'm only gonna talk about three characters in this book because the other ones are irrelevant. If I had to pick a favorite character in this book it would be Danica because she wasn't around in this book long enough for Sarah J Mass to completely destroy her character and ruin everything likable about her. So she's my favorite. Let's start with our leading lady Bryce who is our half fey, half human protagonist. Bryce's whole personality is bodycon dresses and stilettos, if I'm being honest with you. Like, she's definitely a character that Sarah J. Mass was trying to shove down her throat that so she's a feminist as well because she's always, always talking about alpha holes and possessive and aggressive males. But then she also, at the end, 
is like gonna sell her soul for one. So it just, it felt inconsistent. I'm just like, okay. I would like to talk about the fact that she's half a half human, but it really doesn't matter because she still has heightened hearing, still has accelerated healing, and she still has those pointy ears because of course she does. Sarah J Mass needs to have her pointy ears. She loves those pointy ears so much. And she's sexy as hell, as all Faye are. So she gets all the benefits of being Faye, but then she also can say I'm half human. There's really no difference between being half human, half Faye, and being a Faye. The only thing that's somewhat human is that her he her healing is like not as quick as a full Faye, but it's still accelerated, so it's not that big a deal. I really liked her at the beginning because she felt like a a tangible character. Like she felt relatable in the sense that she doesn't have all this magic and she's not special. She's just a person who's just out of college, who is just trying to have fun and is messy and makes mistakes and there's a lot of shit going on in her life that she can't control. And she felt relatable in the fact that she was just going through a lot of shit and she wasn't special. She literally wasn't the chosen one. But then we find out at the end she is the chosen one, she is a starborn fae, and she gets all this magic, so she's become a Mary Sue. Now she's not even barely magical, she has all this magic, she's one of the most powerful beings, she's starborn, she's literally the chosen one. She loses all of the likable and cool qualities about her that make her a unique main character by the end of this book. And that's what was disappointing because I'm like, well, it was nice that she, Sarah Jane was like breaking the mold of her main characters. Like Selena is a chosen one main character completely. So it was nice that she broke the mold a bit, but then she didn't. Like at the end, she just like basically showed that she can only write one type of character and it is the chosen one. So that was very, very disappointing to me. And she became so, so basic and it was not enjoyable to read. Hunt Athalar is literally resand. And I will talk about that later a bit, but I really don't think I need to get into it because you read his description and you read him and you know he's resand. Like she has, Sergio Mass has character archetypes and she sticks to them and it makes all of her characters seem the same. Once you read one of these guys, like if you read Hunt Athalar first or if you read Resand first, you've read enough of that character archetype, just they're the same character. But he was just bland and angsty the whole time. Like I can appreciate an angsty character. Like I love an angsty boy. Like an angsty sad boy is great. I love that. But it got on my nerves when he was doing this. He's basically just an angsty dick this whole book and he's pining after Sahar and I'm like, at some point you gotta get over it. You're an immortal being. Like I get that she was a big deal to you and you were in love and whatever. She probably, you probably sucked her toes. It was probably a big deal to you, but like get over it. And like, I don't wanna hear about your little pity party you have over your lost love all the time it gets annoying it gets redundant every time we talked about it i'm just like okay you've had hundreds of years to get over it i've only had like a few days and i'm already over her so can you please move on i just started rolling my eyes every time he brought up her and his history with her and her twin because at the end that's really irrelevant like he kills sandriel like very quickly in the end it doesn't even really matter it just it was very 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 annoying because it was so irrelevant in the end so i would like to talk a bit about rune which is the last character i'm going to focus on because rune is obviously bryce's half brother and i'm not gonna say he was a character i liked but i liked him more than the other ones at by the end because i just related to him because his whole life just like sucked by the end of it his life got turned upside down by the end and like basically his his whole life, the only good thing about his life up to this point has been that he's the chosen one because he has all his daddy issues, right? And the only good thing about his life is that he's the chosen one. He's special. But then at the end, we find out that Bryce is the real chosen one and that's all like taken away from Rune. This means that he's not even like the special Starborn Fae. He's like the dollar store shit version of a Starborn Fae. It reminded me of like a group project where like one person does all the work the whole time and then the other person swoops in at the end, does one thing and gets all the credit for it. Rune's been taking all of daddy's abuse and all the responsibility being the prince of the fae and the chosen one and then bryce swoops in at the end does a little light show and now she's the special one and then runes irrelevant i'm not going to talk about any of the other characters because they all have zero personality and they're all irrelevant so we can move on next up we're going to talk about the fact that this book has a lot of similarities to akatar and is arguably the same story as akatar this is going to kind of spoil akatar not too many details but the general story arc of the first book at least so akatar ends all happy-go-lucky they beat amarantha fae died she was resurrected she has magic now. They're just having a PG time. This book ends basically the same. We beat Micah and all these weird random side evil characters. Bryce technically dies and then gets resurrected and has all this power and it's just a PG time. They end up together. It's really great. As much as we already kind of can tell Hunt and Reese are the same character, I would also like to point out some similarities that are kind of specific. So Reese was a slave to Amarantha, was having his magic somewhat suppressed. At the end of Akatar, he is freed and having a great ass time. And Hunt is a slave to the Republic and his magic is being suppressed and at the end he's freed as well. So their story arcs are very, very, very similar. We can also talk about the fact that Bryce 
starts off this book with like no power and then she ends it with all of this power because she touches the gate and she is given all these drops of power from everybody who's ever touched the gate which is basically the same as all the high lords at the end of Akatar giving drops of their power to Feyre to resurrect her and now she has all of this magic. It's like they're literally the same terms are being used. Drops of power. I can already also tell this is going to be another one of Sarah J Mass's first books in a series that is totally irrelevant to the rest of the series. Like, Akatar is basically a prequel to Akamath and Akawar, if we're being honest, and I can already tell that this is just the preface for how Hunt and Bryce get together and Bryce gets all of her magic. I can just tell this is going to fall into that first book syndrome where just, like, it's totally irrelevant to the rest of the series. But, like, it's not the exact same, well, how it happens, but, like, Favor's body dies and she is brought back to life with power and Bryce's body dies when she makes the drop and she's brought back to life with power. It is the same, you know? Like, the little intricacies are a little bit different, but the actual plot is the same. Like, some of the characters are even the same. Like, Hunt is literally resand, tattoos, wings, angsty. But then this other character, Fury, who again has zero personality, is totally irrelevant, is literally Amarin. Like, she is short. She is of an unknown species, but super powerful. She has a dark bob haircut, which is like, it seems like a weird thing to point out, but it's, it, it, stuck out to me. Like she has the same like merciless secretive personality. She's literally Amarin and I don't understand why Sergio Mas can't come up with unique characters. It just it get, becomes frustrating at some point. So yeah my prediction for the rest of this series is that like I'm 99.9% .9 sure that this series is going to end with us like taking down the Asteri and the Republic and all that because we always bring it up randomly. Like it had nothing to do with this book but then we also brought it up a lot of times in this book that like we're all slaves to the Republic, so we're definitely going to be meeting up with the human rebels, which is another thing that happens in this book, or is going on during this book. There's a human rebellion. So I think that at some point we're going to be fighting with the human rebels to take down the Asteri. I just, I know it's going to happen, so bet. And some final random thoughts I have about this book. Um, the tagline of this book, through love all is possible, this is like the main quote of this novel. I think it's dumb. I'm sorry. That quote is so unremarkable to me, like through love all is possible. That's just saying like, friendship is magic love is the most powerful magic of all like that is such a basic tagline that's like all of harry potter bro broken down is through love all is possible like what is this my little pony friendship is magic shit through love all is possible is such a basic concept like i don't know it was very unremarkable i don't know why people are super hyped about the tagline some final thoughts here i think that sarah Dumas has patterns and all of her books will always resemble each other because she has clear patterns that she sticks to very clearly and clear character types that she sticks to so I don't expect the rest of the series to be very unique. I expect it to kind of feel the same as this one in the sense that it's going to feel like her other books. There was a lot of potential in this book to be very unique and then Sergio Mass toward the end just like fell into that pattern of the other books and I think that I've fallen out of Sarah J. Mass's books. I think I've fallen out of that phase in my life where I am willing to look over some of the more weird and more tropey stereotypical and like strange parts of her books so I think that if I reread those other books and I probably will to be honest I'm not going to be as enthralled or impressed I'm not gonna have the same feeling reading them like I was thinking about this the other day I love Akamath a lot but I think if I were to read it now I'm not going to like it I will be reading the rest of this series when it comes out but yeah I this was not that remarkable to me to be honest and definitely could have been better. I hope this went okay, and if you've gotten to this point in this video, thank you so much for watching. Tell me your thoughts on this book down below, because I'm curious. If you want to see a contrast from this me with these feelings, two out of five star Bailey to five out of five star Bailey, you can watch that vlog. I think it's an interesting thing to look at, just kind of see how my opinions changed so rapidly, because right after I finished the book, like, I was already kind of, like, skeptical. I'm like, why did I read this five stars? Like, I don't, I don't want the five star feeling, right? So then I immediately after I started questioning it, and then, like, it just, I kept questioning it until I'm like, damn, this is a two star book. So it happens sometimes, you know? You have to do some soul searching sometimes when you read a book. But that's this review. I hope it went okay. I want to do more reviews on my channel, so hopefully... You enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Bailey. Bye-bye.